Professor Sean Freeman yes. from the University of Manchester, who is going to talk about searching for a public institutions. It's pretty good we have to so we're looking forward. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. So I was asked to tell you about the discoveries of the electron, the proton, and the neutron. And I'll admit, as Joe will tell you, I was rather reluctant to begin with, wasn't I? Because I'm not a historian. Um, I'm a, a nuclear physicist when I'm not having to spend my time running the School of Physics and Astronomy at Manchester. Um, but I was persuaded. So I was persuaded on the basis that I would give the physicist view of the history rather than an academic historian's analysis. Um, but also, I was motivated by duty, because actually the University of Manchester is either directly or indirectly um, involved with practically all of the things I'm going to tell you. So I'm going to do a little bit of Manchester marketing on the way. Okay. Now, discovery itself is really misleading. Right? You don't just walk over and go, oh, look, there's the proton. Right? Um, the emergence of a new idea or concept, in reality, is very, very messy. Um, no one person deserves all the credit, despite the stories that we tell ourselves about these things. Attributing discovery just to one person is as ridiculous as attributing the discovery of America to Columbus. Ideas float around in flawed embryonic forms for many years uh, until they're pushed forward firmly and robustly by those people who tend to become famous names. Electrons, protons and, uh, and neutrons exist in the literature in a variety of different guises long before their discovery as components of atoms. And actually, for my purposes, I think I'm going to use the definition of discovery as um, you know, when it was demonstrated that these particles were truly components of all atoms and not just the product of a specific experiment or a specific atom. So that idea of universality is really important. Um, despite the promises earlier on, splitting the atom is another awful term which got attributed to many discoveries in the early part of the 20th century. It sort of suggests that the atom is some kind of continuous thing that you can just cut in two, a bit like splitting peas for a soup. Um, but actually, atoms are not amorphous lumps of gloop that you can just cut in two. They're rather intricate structures, if we've, as we've started to um, uh, understand. And actually, despite the fact it's, it's less poetic, but really knocking bits out is a lot more descriptive. So it's been interesting for me to delve back into the 19th and early 20th century uh, and look to see what scientists are doing. Because the elements of truly excellent research are the same then as they are now. So you have you know, really clever people doing really ingenious experiments. Those experiments require equipment and technology allows people to build that, those equipment. And, um, and also, you know, scientists communicate and collaborate. No, you know, no one is an island. And actually, this phrase of um, uh, standing on the shoulders of giants, which we often attribute to Newton, but actually has been in use since the 12th century, is as apposite as it ever was. Now, how many physicists do I have in the audience? Oh dear, right, a few. Um, but there are many people who didn't stick their hand up then, so I have to do a quick Physics 101 um, on... Uh, the forces on charged particles in electric and magnetic fields uh, to help you understand some of the things I'm going to say about electrons and protons in particular. Now, I think we're probably all aware that electrical charges, um, or like charges repel and unlike charges attract, um, a positive charge in an electric field will therefore be attracted to the negatively charged cathode. Um, and if the charge is moving... Um, then those forces will gently pull the particle as it moves along its track and, and will deflect it, in this case, rather like a parabolic form like that. The force depends on the strength of the electric field uh, and the size of the charge. Um, and the acceleration it experiences depends on the mass and the force via Newton's second law F equals ma. So if you measure the deflection of a charged particle in an electric field, it allows you to deduce the charge to mass ratio for that particle. Now you should also be familiar that currents in magnetic fields experience forces. 
These are the forces that drive electrical motors. There are the strange forces because the, the force that a current experience is perpendicular to the direction of the current and the direction of the magnetic field. And of course, if currents are just moving charges, so if you have a moving charge, it will experience a force if it's in a magnetic field. Um, that force, again, depends on the strength of the field, um, and it depends on the charge, but it also depends on how fast it's moving, the velocity. Now, if all of that was beyond you, my takeaway message is purely uh, the motion of charged particles is deflected by electric magnetic fields. So let's start with the electron. Now, its emergence um, in the turn of the 20th century rests firmly on the study of um, electrical phenomena over millennia. So in the 1700s, electricity was thought to be some kind of fluid. An excess of it gave a positive charge and a deficit gave a negative charge. Um, and lots of people were studying electrical conduction. And for our purposes today, it's conduction through fluids and gases, which was really important in establishing the electron. Now, in 1834, Faraday um, noted his law of electrolysis. Now, electrolysis is the passage of electricity through liquids. And, you know, if you are, for the younger people in the audience, if you're searching through your wallet to try and find Faraday on the back of a 20-quid note, I'm afraid these were discontinued in 2008, but there he is. Um, so it's easy to explain electrolysis and Faraday's law if we understand the atomic structures that are going on. Now, Faraday was oblivious to this, uh, but if you take a uh, salt like silver chloride and dissolve it in water, the molecule forms um, positively charged silver ions and negatively charged chlorine ions. And it's these ions that carry the electricity through the solution. If we just want to concentrate on what's happening at the cathode for a moment, um, to pass electricity, electrons are going to have to leave that cathode. And they do that by combining with the positive silver ions to form silver atoms. So during this process, you start to get silver um, deposited at the electrode. Now, to carry a certain amount of electricity, a certain number of electrons must leave the cathode, and so a certain number of silver atoms are deposited. Now, if you do something like this, where you pass the same amount of electricity through two different solutions, um, then you um, end up with the same number of atoms appearing in elemental form here and here. So you get silver deposited here, hydrogen deposited here, the same amount of electricity deposits the same number of silver atoms, the same number of hydrogen atoms, um, but those two atoms have different masses. Silver is much heavier than hydrogen, so you get a higher mass of silver deposited than hydrogen. And that's Faraday's law. He found that a current flowing succession, through a succession of solutions of different monovalent elements deposits a mass which is proportional to the uh, atomic mass of those elements. Now, monovalent is a term that is coming from chemistry. Um, don't worry about it. I'm just using it here to say those are singly charged ions. Now, of course, he knew nothing about that, but he, he noticed this law. If you like, it's one of Peter's accounting rules that are associated with atoms. But by the 1850s, people were starting to perhaps believe in the existence of atoms. They were the core, seen as the core of matter and were associated with carrying electricity. So Faraday's law, if you think about it, suggests that a monovalent atom is associated in electrolysis by carrying a certain amount of fundamental charge. If you have a divalent atom, it will be doubly charged and carry twice as much. So a particular amount of electricity could be associated with atoms in integer units. Now, you can easily measure the amount of charge passed through the circuit, and you can easily measure the amount of element that's deposited, so you can calculate the charge-to-mass ratio of the material. That's exactly the same as the charge-to-mass ratio for one of the uh, ions. Um, so for purposes later, it was found that the hydrogen ion had the highest charge-to-mass ratio, largely because they don't, you know, the mass is so small. If you know the number of atoms per gram, then you can use that measurement to work out the charge on one of these ions. Except that 
that wasn't very well known. And actually, it's very difficult in the 19th century to determine that. But in 1874, this chap here, uh, George Johnson Stoney, who was an Irish physicist at Queen's University, estimated that quantity using the kinetic theory of gas molecules and extracted this fundamental quantity of electricity, um, which he called the electron. Now, um, he's about a factor of five too small, but actually that's not bad. That's not bad for the time. Um, and it was just a quantity isn't, of electricity. It's not a particle. So, in the latter half of the 19th century, people were looking at how electricity passed through gases at low pressure. This was possible because of new vacuum pumps to extract air from containers, um, and also new power supplies to create high voltages between electrodes in those vessels. Um, early versions of gas discharge lamps like this were produced in the 1850s, and when high voltage supplies passed electricity through these gases, they were found to glow. Now, we now know that this glowing is due to the ionisation of gas atoms into ions and electrons, and when they recombine to form atoms, it gives off light. And so you get these little pretty, pretty, blow, pretty, pretty glows. Now, as the technology improved, you could make better vacuum, and so actually those ions under the influence of the electric field could travel further before they crashed into some residual gas atom that hadn't been pulled out by the vacuum pump. Now, when you have those kinds of um, very rarefied gases, then just naturally some ions may form. And in the high voltage, the ions are pulled and accelerated towards the electrodes. So the positive gas atoms will be pulled towards the negative cathode, and when they smash into it, it will liberate loads of electrons. Those electrons will all be pulled towards the positive anode. Some of them will miss and hit the glass at the back of the wall. And it was found that you've got this ghostly green glows uh, coming from what were called cathode rays. And there were big arguments about these cathode rays, which were divided on an Anglo-German uh, split. The Brits were all convinced that they were some form of charged particle. The Germans thought they were a new form of electromagnetic radiation. So there was lots of people doing lots of stuff. I'm going to try and illustrate it with a, a modern version of, of one of these tubes. Um, so here, when you switch the tube on and you switch the light off, you can see the ghostly green glow that I was talking about. Um, and... Um, Really, the, I think the Germans thought that it was electromagnetic radiation because the only thing that produced this kind of fluorescence was actually the act that they'd heard about before was the action of ultraviolet light on substances. This guy, Plucker, made a nice Maltese cross anode and saw that it cast a shadow in the ghostly green glow. Um, and he concluded that cathode rays travelled in straight lines. Uh, so this is a bit like you know, casting a shadow with rays of light. Uh, Jürgen Goldstein, who's just here, uh, from Berlin in 1876, showed that cathode rays were emitted perpendicular to the surface of the cathode. Now, that's a bit odd if it's electromagnetic radiation, because electromagnetic radiation is normally radiated in all different directions at once. Uh, and Henrik Hertz, who's just here, showed that cathode rays could pass through metal foils, like some electromagnetic rays can, but also just exactly like little tiny particles smaller than atoms might. Um, now, Arthur Schuster, um, who's just here, from of all places, the University of Manchester, um, found that uh, cathode rays could be bent in electric fields as if they were negatively charged. Crooks, uh, who's just here, um, whose name is given to these vacuum tubes, and he was working in, in, in London, and he's got a particularly magnificent moustache. Um, he showed that they could be deflected by a, a, um, a magnet, which you can see if you compare this picture to this one with a magnet, you'll be able to see the, the shadow moves slightly up as the cathode rays are bent that way. If you put the magnetic field on the other side, or flip the polarity, you can see that they're slightly bent down. Um, and... As you know from my Physics 101, that's exactly what happens to moving charged particles in a magnetic field. An electromagnetic field is unaffected by 
electric and magnetic fields in that way. Um, this chap here has a magnificent hat. That's Perrin, and he captured, he caught some of these cathode rays in a cup and directly showed that actually that accumulated a negative charge. So there were lots of ideas floating around. And um, what you really need is somebody to draw those ideas together. And, and that person was J.J. Thompson, who we've heard about already uh, today. Um, incidentally, he was a graduate of Owens College, which was a forerunner of the University of Manchester. <laughs> um, he called the particles forming cathode rays corpuscles, and they would become our electrons. Now, J.J. carefully repeated some of these deflection measurements. Um, and you remember that um, the force of a charge in an electric field depends on the charge of the particles. Uh, a magnetic force depends on the charge and the velocity. So if you deflect through both magnetic and electric fields, you can deduce the velocity of the particles. So he did that, and he was astonished. These things were travelling enormously fast, a thousand times the speed of hydrogen molecules moving in hydrogen gas. Um, indeed, faster than anything that had been measured before, about a third of the speed of light. He used the electrical deflection to carefully measure the charge-to-mass ratio, and it was huge. It was 17 to 1,800 times the charge-to-mass ratio of the hydrogen plus iron that had been deduced in electrolysis, which was so far the highest. This was even bigger. Um, and that E over M value seemed to be universally constant, irrespective of the parameters of producing the cathode rays. So you'd use different shapes of electrodes, different gas pressures, different electrode material, always came up with the same value. And moreover, he found these corpuscles everywhere. So um, he, you, can, you can get them um, if you heat up metal, if you shine light on certain metals. They're emitted by radioactive substances. We were starting to see that these electron corpuscles were a universal component of matter. And so that's why J.J. Thompson is usually referred to as the discoverer of the electron. Now, clearly, the charge on the electron is, is a really important thing. Um, we saw that um, um, Sony tried to deduce it earlier on. Um, but because this E over M is so large, either the charge on the electron is huge or its mass is tiny. And without knowing the charge, you don't know which is which. So there were, that spurred on lots of measurements of the charge on the electron. Um, now, there were several measurements made by a number of different people in Cambridge at the time. Um, they were spurred on by a discovery made by this chap, C.T.R. Wilson, also a Manchester alumnus. Um, he showed that ions act as centres for condensation from a vapour. So if you make a vapour by spurting some ions into, in, into, into, into some um, air, um, you can, the vapour will condense around those ions. Uh, you can find the number of droplets if you somehow measure the total mass of water in the vapour, and also the, um, the average mass of one drop. Um, it's relatively easy to measure the total charge on that vapour cloud. And so if you combine all of that, you get the charge per drop. And then making the assumption that one ion produces one drop, you've effectively measured the charge on one of those ions, which has to be a multiple of this fundamental unit of electricity. Now, there's lots of tricks in how they did that, and there's lots of holes and traps and problems, uh, and actually, that's why this chap, Robert Milliken, uh, he's the one that's remembered for measuring the charge on the electron. He did it with individual oil drops, which gets you out of an awful amount of trouble, and he came up with this value here, which is pretty good compared to the current modern version of the mass on the electron. So, so there you have it. It turned out that the fundamental charge was exactly the same as the, char the positive charge on a hydrogen ion. So electrons were truly tiny. The mass is um, 
1,700 to 1,800 times smaller. And actually, we've, we've never directly measured a charge which is less than that value. Um, and so the fundamental unit of electricity becomes tied up with Thomson's corpuscles or our electrons. Um, and it was, as a coder, later in the 1930s, positively charged particles were discovered with the same mass and charge as the electron, the antimatter um, counterparts of electrons, uh, so-called positrons or anti-electrons. So we're done with the electron. It's a fundamental component of all atoms. What about protons? So there's some early hints of protons. Um, the proton is the atomic nucleus of a hydrogen atom. Way back in 1815, William Prout, who was a physician actually, um, part-time chemist working in London, um, he noticed that the early measurements of atomic masses appeared to be integer multiples of the mass of the hydrogen atom. And he suggested that all atoms were made up of hydrogen atoms. He called them protiles, and you can see the name starting to develop. Now, it was a rather simplistic and actually incorrect interpretation, because as more measurements came in, um, some of the atomic masses didn't turn out to be integers of a hydrogen atom, and that's because of the existence of isotopes, which I'll come to a little bit later on. But this does seem to be the first suggestion that protons were the components of all atoms. Now, you remember Eugene Goldstein that I mentioned earlier on, um, in 18. 86, he drilled holes in the cathode of a Crookes tube and showed that you get these lovely coloured streamers going the other way to the cathode rays. And those are the positively charged components. Those are moving gas ions. Um, and if you use hydrogen, those would be protons. And some people attribute the discovery of the proton to, to Goldstein, but actually he had no idea that they were universal components of all atoms, so I'm not counting him as the discoverer. Um, different fill gases gave different positive rays with different charge-to-mass ratios, um, and due to the different masses, due, that's due to the different masses of the positive ions. In 1898, um, uh, Vine showed that hydrogen produced anode rays with the largest E over M. Kind of not surprising, given the findings of hydrogen plus ions in electrolysis. Now, we heard earlier that J.J. Uh, Thompson, in the early part of the 20th century, developed a very crude model of the atom. Uh, negative electron corpuscles, which I have as red. I think that was the same color as yours? Yes. But my, my blob is blue, I'm afraid. Uh, um, and so there, the, the, this is called the plum pudding model. The electrons are uh, the plums in the pudding, and ions are produced by extracting the plums from the pudding. Now we head back to Manchester, where Ernest Rutherford, who was my great-great-grand supervisor, if, <laughs> if I'm allowed to have genealogy of research supervision. He was fresh from pioneering research in Canada, uh, and he'd just been given a job at Manchester. In, eight, in 19, 1906, he, he noticed that when you pass a beam of alpha particles through a metal foil, the beam spreads out. Now, um, that was from a radium source. Radium was one of the most expensive substances at the time. Very precious, not many people had it. It was extracted from uranium, and it emits an alpha particle, which was one of the three types of radioactivity that had been characterised in 1900. There are several more known now. Uh, and just after coming to Manchester, Rutherford proved that alpha particles were uh, identical to the atomic nuclei of helium. He assigned an undergraduate student, Ernest Marsden, to work with uh, Hans Geiger of the eponymous counterfame, uh, and they did some very careful measurements over the winter of uh, 1909 and revealed a very strange phenomenon. In addition to this slight spreading of the alpha particle beam as it passed through foils, uh, as Peter mentioned earlier, some of them came back in their face through very large deflections. And now, whilst the slight spreading was consistent with Thomson's um, plum pudding model, the large deflections certainly weren't. And Rutherford pondered quite a while, 
over the next winter and then made a stunning announcement to the Manchester Literary and Philosophical Society in March 1911. The theory of J.J. Thomson does not entertain a very large deflection of alpha particles transversing across a single atom unless it is supposed that the diameter of the sphere of positive electricity is minute compared to the diameter of influence of the atom. So the nuclear atom was born, a minute positively charged nucleus capable of reversing the trajectories of a small number of alpha particles making head-on collisions, as in this diagram just here. It carries practically all of the atomic mass with the electrons somehow orbiting around it. And this finding, along with football, cotton mills and Boddington's beer, is still used in the marketing of the city of Manchester today. I would note, though, several other Manchester beers are available. Um, Marsden, um, in 1914 and 15, continued some of these studies with alpha particle beams and was looking at how alpha particles travelled through hydrogen gas. He discovered that they could be knocked forward. Um, so an alpha could collide with a hydrogen atom, a proton, and knock it forward in what is known as an elastic collision. Um, so this is a bit like playing nuclear billiards. Um, an elastic collision, uh, the total kinetic energy is conserved. So this is what's going on in a neutron's cradle, where this ball collides with all of them, and the final one pops out the, out the other end with the same kinetic energy. As opposed to an inelastic collision, where some of the energy of the collision is used to change the colliding particles. Um, so these knocked-on hydrogen nuclei, or protons, travelled four times the range of the alpha particles, and he found that several different targets seem to produce these same long-range particles, but at a rate that seemed to far exceed the amount of stray hydrogen that might have been in the material. Um, he thought perhaps they were coming from the source itself, but he wasn't quite sure. And, and actually, he, he, he didn't have time to finish the job off because he, he got employed in New Zealand. He did come back to Europe, but only to serve in the First World War. Uh, and that disrupted things. So Rutherford, intrigued, continued making his own measurements um, sporadically when he could between his war work. He, he'd made major contributions to the development of sonar detection of submarines during the First World War. Those intermittent um, experiments were completed shortly afterwards and published in four classic papers in 1919, June 1919, so almost exactly 100 years ago. He used electromagnetic deflections to show that these knocked-on particles from hydrogen gas were indeed hydrogen nuclei, or protons, um, by their E over M. He measured their velocities in the same way that J.J. Thompson had done with electrons. He showed, actually, that in very close collisions between alpha particles and nuclei, the characteristics were completely inconsistent with electrical forces and I believe that's the first indication of the strong nuclear force coming into play. He carefully measured swift oxygen and nitrogen atoms produced by elastic collisions of alpha particles in those gases. Uh, and an example shown here of a, a later um, cloud chamber picture of some of those interactions. Then he found something truly surprising. If he was looking at protons produced in the interactions of alphas on hydrogenous material in a vacuum, he found that if he put nitrogen in, then the number of protons produced dramatically increased. And he did a huge number of very careful and very painstaking uh, experiments to eliminate all the other possibilities other than it was the alphas interacting with the nitrogen nuclei themselves that produced those protons. And, and here's his conclusion. Um, it's very cautious. It's difficult to avoid the conclusion that the long-range atoms arising from the collision of alphas with nitrogen are not nitrogen atoms, but probably atoms of hydrogen. If this be the case, 
we must conclude that the nitrogen atom is disintegrated under the intense forces developed in a close collision with a swift alpha particle, and that the atom which is liberated formed a constituent part of the nitrogen nucleus. Now, um, that's a, a fairly typical cautious Rutherford statement. He had actually induced the first nuclear reaction uh, initiated by um, human beings, and later experiments showed that what was true with nitrogen was also true with other gases and metallic foils. So these H atoms, or protons, were indeed a universal constituent of all atoms, and there we go, bingo, the discovery of the proton as a, as a component of atoms. Now, Rutherford was very careful and racked with worry. What happens if there was a bit of hydrogen stuck on some of these things, and that was producing these protons. And he couldn't relieve himself of that worry for years afterwards, until in 1921, careful experiments with James Chadwick showed that, um, um, that the elastically knocked on protons had energies which were actually very different from those which were liberated in his nuclear reactions, um, removing that, that problem. And actually, um, some very painstaking research by uh, Rutherford's student in Cambridge, Patrick Blackett, yielded these lovely uh, cloud chamber photographs of the reactions actually happening. Uh, and so Blackett became the first person to really understand the details of the process. Uh, an alpha particle fused with a nitrogen nucleus to momentarily produce a fluorine nucleus, which then emitted a proton, leaving uh, a residual oxygen nucleus, as you can see just here. Incidentally, Blackett then moved to Manchester <laughs> in 1939 and won the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1948 for his work on cosmic rays. But important for our continuing story is that in the late 1920s, these protons that were coming out from these reactions were shown not to be all of the same energy. They formed protons of different groups of energies. And that, people thought, was probably the nucleus being left in an excited state, which in all probability then decayed by the emission of a gamma ray. Um, that's a high energy quanta of electromagnetic radiation. It's the third type of radioactivity that had been uh, established uh, by 1900. I know I haven't mentioned the second one yet, but I will in a moment. Okay, so finally, two neutrons. The word neutron had been in the literature, oh dear. Um, the word neutron had been in the literature since the late um, 1800s. But in 1920, it was clear from Rutherford's work that protons did exist in the nucleus. Seemingly, electrons did as well because they knew about beta radiation. So this is the second form of radioactivity. Um, and that was shown to be electrons by Becquerel's measurement of the charge to matter ratio in 1900. And so it looked like electrons existed in the nucleus as well. Um, Francis Aston here, I think, is the only other physicist that shares one of my passions, which is surfing. <laughs> I think it was more unusual in the early part of uh, the 20th century than it is now, but he, he learned to surf in Hawaii, apparently. Uh, he's more famously known for making very accurate uh, atomic mass measurements, and he revealed the existence of, of isotopes. The fact that nuclei of the same element, the same number of protons, can exist with different masses. Um, that actually explains the deviations from Prout's rule that I mentioned earlier on. Um, so, it appeared as if the nuclear mass was many times, you know, it was higher than that could be attributed to the protons in the nucleus. So um, that meant there was something else there making up the mass. So perhaps these electrons inside the nucleus were somehow bound to other protons to make neutral entities, and it was those additional neutral entities which were making up the additional mass of the nucleus. 
Uh, and there was lots of hypothesis about these so-called neutrons, particularly by Rutherford and also chemists in, in the States. I believe it was only Rutherford who actually tried to find these neutral objects in electrical discharges in hydrogen and actually found absolutely nothing. Um, it was recognised at the time that these neutral particles would be really useful. Um, if you're trying to initiate nuclear actions between two charged particles, they, they repel each other. So you have to really push them together to make a nuclear action. Neutral particles, you don't have that problem. So it was actually recognised quite early that these would be very, very useful if you're initiating nuclear reactions. So um, before um, the 1920s, Experiments were largely done by detecting charged particles, alphas, protons, and recoiling nuclei, by the little flashes of light or scintillation that they produce when they hit zinc sulfide screens. They were counted by people looking down microscopes, so counted with the human eye. It was really difficult work. You had to be really careful, and that human element meant that it was not always so robust. There were dramatic arguments between Rutherford's group and a group in Vienna, which was attributed to some of these. So people started turning to electrical methods of counting. This had been first developed by Rutherford and Geiger way back in 1908 in Manchester, the early version of the Geiger counter. And these electrical methods could be done continuously. People get tired, so you can't do it continuously with scintillation. Um, they also count much higher rates of radioactivity. They were more reliable at very low rates, and they could directly measure the particle's energy um, rather than inferring it from ranges that particles travelled in gases. They were also sensitive to gamma rays. Um, and that was useful because Rutherford and Chadwick's measurements of these proton groups suggested that gamma rays were going to be emitted in these nuclear reactions. Um, except for those experiments, you needed a different substance to radium. Uh, you needed polonium, which was uh, an element that had been discovered by, um, by um, Pierre and Marie Curie in 1898. Um, it produced much fewer gamma rays directly from the source than radium did. Um, so if you saw gamma rays, you could tell it was from the reaction and not from the source. And at the time, groups in Paris, Berlin and Cambridge had enough polonium to do these experiments. In Berlin, Walter Bota and his student Becker were doing experiments to survey these nuclear reactions to see whether they could find gamma rays. And they found protons and gamma rays produced on, in most cases, except for reactions on lithium and beryllium, which seem to just emit gamma rays. Uh, the beryllium produced a really penetrating radiation, but no protons. And they just assumed it was a really high-energy gamma ray. So alphas on beryllium produced a gamma ray. In the Paris lab, because polonium had been discovered there, they had the biggest world supply. They also had the best expertise, so they had a source which was 10 times the strength of the one in Berlin. So Irina Curie, who's just here, and her Mary's daughter and Frederick Joliot, um, her husband, they found that this beryllium radiation was actually much more penetrating and even higher energy than um, the uh, Berlin group thought. And at the time, Robert Millikan was in Paris, talking about whether cosmic rays produce protons and electrons. And so the Curies decided to see if protons were emitted when the beryllium radiation fell on different substances. And actually it didn't. It only produced protons in substances that carried a lot of hydrogen, like paraffin. And in a series of very elaborate experiments, they showed that this beryllium radiation knocked protons out of the paraffin in elastic collisions. The trouble was, to do that, this gamma ray energy would have to be five or six times the energy of the alpha particle that produced it. And that was you know, causing some problems. Cambridge had some polonium. And Hugh Webster, under James Chadwick's direction... Oh, did I forget to tell you James Chadwick was a Manchester undergraduate? <laughs> they reproduced Berlin's findings but noticed that the beryllium radiation appeared to be strongest in the direction of the alpha particle. 
Um, so if that was actually a particle rather than a gamma ray, that would make sense. It's a billiard ball collision. Gamma rays should be emitted in all directions. Um, so it looked like particle rather than radiation. If it were a neutron of a similar mass to the proton, then energy momentum conservation in the collision suggested a rather modest energy for the neutrons, not some tremendously high, ga high gamma ray energy, removing those energetic problems. So actually Webster looked for these particles in cloud chambers and saw nothing. It was later shown that actually his sources were just far too weak. So Chadwick investigated further. Um, he did this with an ionization chamber and a counter, an early chart recorder, but he needed stronger sources. So he went and talked to his mates. He'd recently been to John Hopkins University in Baltimore and seen radon, a decay product of radium, being used to treat patients in a hospital. Now, radon decays very, very quickly into polonium, and so the therapeutic value of radon um, quickly ran out. Chadwick was given these dead radon cells, useless for curing people, but full of polonium, and he quickly had even more polonium than the curies did in Paris. So much that he managed to uh, do experiments on beryllium radiation on a range of different substances, uh, and measured the energy of any recalling species in about 10 days. Um, he showed that the recoiling um, nuclei that were produced in those collisions were perfectly consistent with beryllium radiation being a neutral particle of the same, as the same mass as the proton. And within 10 days, he'd sent a letter that was published in uh, the article called, uh, as an article in, in the Nature Journal, which is pretty fast publishing, even for modern standards. So that he concluded the existence of the neutron, or he was cautious, like Rutherford, or energy momentum conservation just doesn't work. Now, um, very quickly, and then I'll finish, the neutron mass from those early experiments was not very accurate. Um, if a neutron is a proton bound to a proton, then its mass should be a little bit less than the sum of the masses of the proton and the electron. And it wasn't until 1935 when Chadwick and Goldhaber were splitting up deuterium, the proton and neutron in deuterium, separating them, that they were able to deduce that the mass of the neutron was actually slightly heavier than the mass of the proton and electron, showing it was a particle in its own right. Now, it's quiet. There's a... There's a trend for um, quoting famous people's quotes that seemed rather silly at the time. And so Chadwick, um, in 1932, just after the discovery of the neutron, said, I'm afraid that neutrons will not be of any use to anyone. Um, he was later proved very, very, very wrong. Here he is sitting with uh, Leslie Groves, who ran the Manhattan Project. So, by the early 1930s, Atomic constituents would be determined, and the basic framework of nuclear structure was known. Even if the details weren't, I don't think at the time anybody realised how hard it would be to understand this mass of protons and neutrons interacting by very strong forces. It's something that we're still studying. Um, soon after, reactions were done which produced artificial radioactivity, both with charged particles by the Joliot Curies and with neutrons by Feather and more famously Fermi. Particle accelerators were being built for the first time to help initiate nuclear reactions with charged particles. Fission was just about to be discovered by the interaction of neutrons and heavy elements. A war was just about to start. Nuclear physics was about to lose its innocence uh, before proving itself more valuable in much more positive ways later on. I'll stop. You could carry on going if you like, but I'll stop. <laughs>
so, so that's one of the issues. The, the fundamental assumption of, of, of the Cambridge work mm. really was that you, you have you know, one iron that produces one draw. But they were also um, you know, making measurements of the, if you like, the ensemble of many drops. So I they were see. making assumptions about averages. And that's really where well, Millikan um, <coughs> was using oil droplets, which actually, the, the oil doesn't evaporate. I the drop see. doesn't change size. He was also making measurements on individual drops rather than, rather than um, making assumptions about averages in a cloud. So mm. that's really why he, you know, he's attributed with that. And those, like, those were really much more accurate measurements. Mm. Although there was some controversy that he was very selective in which drops he used <laughs> to actually determine the final answer. Some of them he, he and I think there's a great debate as to whether you know, whether that practice was um, correct or not. Thank you. Thank you. More questions? Yes, we have. Is this a fanciful memory from physics classes at school, but there's another demonstration that electrons and particles is a an evacuated tube with a paddle wheel in the middle and the beam of electrons pointed at it. I, I think that's photons, isn't it? <coughs> yeah, so, so the, uh, I think the experiment you're referring to was a, a fairly ingenious looking uh, uh, evacuated glass tube with um, a, a paddle wheel running on rails and uh, oh. an electron beam fire. Oh, the okay. Paddle. Yeah, so I, thi I, I, I think there is some worries about how that gets interpreted because there's all sorts of heating effects. Yeah. So I, I, I think the... the so I think yeah, who's it? But does prove what yeah, so, 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 so you fire a beam of electrons at a paddle wheel on a rotor and it appears to turn. Yeah. And so you, you, you make some conclusion that it's the momentum of the electrons on the paddle wheel which is turning it. But there's all sorts of heating effects going on in there which makes the interpretation somewhat cloudy, yeah. I believe. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.